Tonight's majlis has been sponsored for Marhum Muhammad Jafar Hussain Dimani, Surah Al Mubarakat Al Fatiha. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله لقد جاءت رسول ربنا بالحق الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء المرسلين خاتم النبيين سيدنا والنبينا ومولانا أبي القاسم المستقى محمد وبيعله الطيبين الطاهرين المحسومين المظلومين صل على صاحب الدعوة النبوية وصولة الحيدرية والعسمة الفاطمية والحلم الحسنية والشجاعة الحسينية وصبر السجادية وآثار الباطرية ومؤاسر الصادقية وعلوم الكاظمية وحجج رضوية وجود التقوية والنقاوة النقوية والحيبة الأسكرية والغيبة الإلهية والقائمة بالحق اللهم عجل وليك الفرج رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي عمري وحل لقطة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد فقد قال الله تبارك وتعالى في كتاب الكريم ومحكم كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل هل يستوي الذين يعلمون والذين لا يعلمون إنما يتذكر أولو الألباب عملنا بالله وصدق الله العلي العظيم There is no doubt that the prophets which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have sent, has sent to this world are all a beacon of guidance for us. And there is no doubt that the Ahlul Bayt, the successors of those prophets that are there to protect those messages are also another beacon of light to gather the prophets and the Ahlul Bayt are those individuals or those role models that we can completely emulate and take them as a role model for our whole life. Whatever facet of life that we feel we need some advice or whatever facet of life that we feel we need an example from, we are able to find it within the life of the Holy Prophets and the A'imma. For example, when it comes to the facet of life of financial aspect, as to, for example, how do I live a life successfully, a life of poverty, and how do I live successfully a life of um, richness? Or, for example, family aspects, such as how do I maintain relationships with those individuals that haven't reciprocated my good nature? Or, for example, the upbringing of the children. Or, for example, societal aspects, such as how to lead a life successfully in a community at the same time, how am I able to be a good citizen towards my community? Educational aspects, the importance of giving, the importance of secular education, of other sciences, as well as the importance of religious education. Whatever facet that we feel that we need advice or examples from, we are able to get it from the Immaculate Life of the Holy Prophets and the, the Ahlul Bayt. However, there are those individuals that we may come across that Although aren't ma'soom, and although may be contemporary within our modern lives, they may come across those individuals that have so immaculately followed the lives of the Holy Prophets and the Ahlul Bayt that they too become a beacon of light. They too become a beacon of guidance. They too become those individuals that we are able to take practical lessons from, those that we can also relate from in the current and modern times. One such individual that I would like to discuss today is a man by the name of Muhammad Hussein. Muhammad Hussein is an individual that comes from Shad Abad. 
He was born in the year 1903 and he passed away in 1981. And he's only lived here half a century ago. This individual was a Sayyid. He was orphaned. His father died at the tender age of when he was five years old and his mother passed away four years after this. This Sayyid orphan by the name of Muhammad Hussein happened to be, grew up to be one of the most leading and the brightest scholars that the modern Muslim era has ever seen. He was one of the most prolific, prominent and original thinkers and philosophers of the Muslim modern era. He was also an inspiring teacher to his students. He was a prolific writer of many books. He was an expert in architecture, an expert in agriculture. His skill within poetry, art and calligraphy were extremely proficient. He was an extremely skilled horse rider, a jockey and even a sharpshooter. So much so that this individual was second to none in the whole of his hometown. This individual was an individual that was also a mathematician. He was, his life was one that we can take examples from. He was full of, he showed hard work and discipline. This individual, this man of many talents, this man of many knowledge of many sciences is a man none other than Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Hussein Taba Tabai, famously known as Allama Taba Tabai. Clearly, Allama Taba Tabai is an individual that is a well accomplished individual. Not only is he a scholar of religious sciences, but he's also an expert of other sciences, be it agriculture, be it um, architecture, poetry, math, maths, be it shoe, horse, horse riding and sharpshooting. And an individual with so many talents clearly deserves some time that we are able to give so that we are able to take some lessons from his life, some practical aspects and examples that we can apply within our lives. Therefore, the topic of discussion that I have chosen for tonight's discussion, tonight's majlis, tonight's lecture is titled Contemporary Lessons, Practical Lessons from the life of the great Allama Taba Taba'i. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. At many places within the Holy Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has stated the importance of scholars on how a man of knowledge is much better than a man without knowledge. Similarly, in traditions and a hadith, we have always given the importance of knowledge and the importance of those that have more knowledge than you. For example, the ayat, the verse of the Holy Quran that I had the honor and the privilege to recite before you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, majestically and in, in all his glory, states in the 39th chapter of the Holy Quran, known as Surah Al-Zumar, verse number 9, he states, قُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الْقُلْ هَلْ يَسْتَوِ الَّذِينَ يَعْلَمُونَ وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَعْلَمُونَ Say, are those individuals, are those who know equal to those who do not know? إِنَّمَا يَتَذَكَّرُ أُولُ الْأَلْبَابِ Indeed, those who know, those that are the people of dhikr, know better. إِنَّمَا يَتَذَكَّرُ أُولُ الْأَلْبَابِ Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Only they will remember who are the people of understanding. Over here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is clearly defining a standard. He is saying that those individuals that are people of knowledge, those that individuals that we associate as scholars are better than those individuals that don't have knowledge. But if we take it a step forward, the Holy Prophet has been quoted to have said, al ulama warafatul anbiya It is a very famous tradition where the Holy Prophet says, that the scholars amongst you are the inheritors, are the heirs of the Holy Prophet. What a powerful statement. He, the, the Holy Prophet is saying that if you want to see the true successor of the prophets, look at the life of the scholars, for this is where you will be able to get examples from. Al-ulama'u warafatul anbiya. Indeed, the scholars are heirs of the Holy Prophet. We take it a step forward. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. states that it will be the day of resurrection. At that point, the scales will be maintained and individuals will be raised on a highland. They'll go to a mountain place. And at that time where the scales will be raised, the ink of a scholar will be put in one scale and the ink of the martyr and the blood of the martyr will, put in, will be put in another scale. 
and the ink of the scholar will outweigh the blood of the martyr. Again, time and time again, we've been encouraged to seek lessons from those that are knowledgeable, those that are scholars, so that we can take some lessons and lifelong experiences from. Therefore, we will dis dedicate the remaining part of the lesson to the life of Alama Taba Tabai. And within this, we will discuss his life into separate categories. And within each of those categories, we'll try and delve a little bit deeper. For example, the first category that we would like to start off with is his hard work, his perseverance, his dedication, and his discipline. Now, many of you in this room today may have already come across the theory known as the iceberg theory. What this iceberg theory suggests is that if you want to look at an iceberg, the visible portion of the iceberg above the water level is only a min min minute part of what is visible to the naked eye. For example, only 10% is visible to the eye. However, 90% of that iceberg is hidden well beneath the waterline. Therefore, in a similar comparison, when we look at the individual, we're only looking at the 10% of that individual. We're only looking at what is at the surface level, what is visible to us. So, for example, a successful individual such as Allah Taba Tabai, we may see him as an individual that is an expert in so many different fields. He is an individual who is so learned, an individual who is an arif, an individual who is well accomplished and has many qualifications. However, what we don't see is the 90% of that which he did to get to that level. For example, we don't realize how much dedication he had. We don't realize how much time and effort that he spent. We don't realize how much discipline, how disciplined he had to lead his life with. We also don't realize how many phases that he had to go through within his own life to get to the point where he is. Let us start from the first example. Alama Taba Taba'i's daughter, she narrates that my father told me that when I was in Najaf pursuing my studies, I wanted to learn mathematics as one of the subjects that I wanted to um, acquire proficiency in. And the only teacher that was available to teach me mathematics was someone who lived at the other side of Najaf and he was only available at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And we all know the exhausting heat of Arabia at, at that particular time. So Alama Taba Taba he says that I would leave my house very early go all the way to the other side of Najaf. By the time I would reach at the location of where my teacher was, I would be, my clothes would be completely covered and drenched in sweat. I would first have to go inside a shower, inside a fountain, quickly dry myself off, and only then would I approach my teacher. This is Alama Taba Tabai who wanted to learn maths. And he could have said that, you know what, this is so far away, it's an exhausting afternoon, it's an exhausting heat, I can just sit home and do my other studies. But Alama Taba Tabai had this focus in mind that he wanted to become an expert mathematician. So he went forward and he persevered, he dedicated and he disciplined his life so that he was able to gain mastery in mathematics. Another instance, for example, before that salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Whilst the Alama was studying in Najaf, the funds from his ancestral lands, the funds from his farms stopped coming and therefore he started facing financial difficulties. So what Alama did, he had to pause his study, he had to go back to where his farmlands were in Shad Abad and he had to start um, cultivating his land and he had to farm and um, grow the crops and vegetation. His son, Sayyid Muhammad um, Mahdi, ba Sayyid Mahdi Baqi, Baba Tabai states, he says that my father had astounding perseverance. Whatever the weather was, whether it was um, extreme winter, rain, cold, or even extreme sunny, I would always see my father leaving early morning, coming very late at night with a umbrella in one hand and working away in the fields all day long and plowing away all day long. And he continued to do that for 10 painstaking long years. Allama Taba Taba'i, if he so wanted, there are so many people that he could have also relied and he could have just said that I'm just going to rely on the help that I get from the people. But Allama Taba Tabai assumed responsibility and he went back to his farmland and rather delegating this responsibility to someone else, he persevered himself. He disciplined himself and he made sure that his irrigation was fixed until he was able to come back. There are many people, for example, who may look down upon those individuals that work hard all day long. For example, an individual by the name of Muhammad Mankadir. 
He was walking past the streets and he noticed an individual working tirelessly with sweat dripping from his face. And he thinks to himself that this individual is working so hard that he's losing away the Akhirah because he's working so hard in this dunya. So he goes closer to that individual and he says that this is no other individual but a chief of all chiefs. This is Imam Muhammad al-Baqir alayhi salam. And he is so tired from working that he's actually resting on a couple of helpers. So he says to himself that an individual at this heat is working so hard for this worldly life. Let me go and advise him. So he goes and approaches Imam Muhammad al-Baqir and he states, you are a chief of all chiefs. You are an imam of the time. You, are, you come from a tribe of Quraysh. You are working so hard and look at your face. It's dripping with sweat. What if death was to overcome you at this point in time? So Imam Muhammad al-Baqir responds to Muhammad bin Mankadir and he says that if death was to overcome to me at this point in time, then I would die at a state where I'm in obedience of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Muhammad bin Mankadir says, what do you mean? He said, the Imam responds to him and he says, the fact that I'm working to get my halal livelihood, to get my legitimate livelihood, means that I'm not in need of people like you or other people. And therefore, this is a way that I am performing my obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Similarly, at that time, when Allama Taba Taba'i needed to fix his lands and he needed to fix his irrigation, he himself took it upon himself to go and work for 10 years in the farms and then he showed his perseverance and determination. After the 10 years, he comes back um, to his studies. And this point, his daughter narrates. Allama's daughter narrates. Now, after discussing the discipline and the dedication and the perseverance and the persistence of Allama Taba Taba'i, if we don't mention one of his most um, biggest achievement, one of the biggest achievements of his life, which is the tafsir of tafsir al-Mizan, then this would be an injustice to his discussion. His daughter narrates that this is a tafsir that took him 18 years after he came back from um, Shad Abad, after he came back and resumed his study from farming. It took him 18 years to compile, and it is a book of 27 volumes. His daughter narrates that my father had astounding perseverance and discipline when it came to his book. My father would wake up very early morning and start researching and compiling his book. In the, at noontime, he would take a short break so that he's able to pray, eat, and take a short nap. And after that, he'll again busy himself on compiling this book until very late at night. And that time, he would stop working on this book. And it took him 18 long years. Not even one day would he take out um, not even one day would he take a break from this book. The only day that he would take a break from this book was the day of Ashura, the 10th day of Muharram, where he would busy himself in the morning of Aba Abdullah. Otherwise, every single day of the year, he would continually busy himself for 18 years in compiling this great book that we have amongst ourselves. Shahid Mutahiri says that this book is so magnanimous, it's so amazing that our generation, the people, our people will only realize its importance after 60 or 100 years after this book has been published. SubhanAllah, this is Allama Taba Taba'i that we are talking about. And this book itself was completed on the day of Laylatul Qadr, where Allama Taba Taba'i himself writes at the beginning of his book that this book has been compiled on the 23rd of Shahr Ramadan on the night of Laylatul Qadr. This these are some of the examples that we can see how Allama Taba Taba'i persevered, dedicated his life to learn all the sciences that he could, be it from mathematics, be it in farming, or even be it in his book of Tafsir al-Mizan. And this is a lesson that we can take, from our, take within our own lives. And if there's anything that we need to do, then it's not going to come in easy. We need to put in the hours, we need to put in the perseverance, and the dedication and the discipline, just like Allama Taba Taba'i did. That was one of the facets, one of the categories that we wanted to take lessons from his life from. Move swiftly moving on. If you remember in the Biladat of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa Alaihi Wasallam, we quickly and very briefly, swiftly touched upon the akhlaq of Allama Taba Taba'i. If you remember, we mentioned how Ayatollah Ibrahim Amini described Allama Taba Taba'i's akhlaq in the outside world. For example, he stated that Allama Taba Taba'i was a kind, chaste, refined, desire-lacking type of individual. He says that I was with the Allama for 30 years, attending his Thursday and Friday classes, and not once do I remember him insulting anyone, being very harsh with anyone, or even interrupting with anyone. 
he would always be very polite and at those classes if someone would refer to him as ustad if someone would ask him would speak to him as professor and call him professor the alama would say please don't give me this title for we are both colleagues in thought trying to learn about the truths of the religion this is the outside life of the alama tabatabai this is the outside akhlaq of alama tabatabai that clearly is a benchmark that we need to follow not only that every time allah ayatullah ibrahim amini says that you would at least visit maybe lay the shrine of lady maqsuma al-qum at least once a week and every time he would walk towards the shrine if he would see a discarded orange peel cucumber or banana peel he would himself take the stuff and put it on the side but all of this is well and good this is the akhlaq that is expected from such an individual at such a high stature at the end of the day this is the akhlaq that is shown to the outside world but however let us deep let us dive a little bit deeper into the akhlaq of alama tabata tabai when it comes to his house life when it comes to his home for that let us ask his daughter alama tabata tabai's daughter narrates that my father was extremely busy and he would be an extremely busy individual and from his busy schedule he would always make sure that he takes at least one hour from his busy schedule to spend with family time and at that one hour where he would be spending his time with family he would be so polite he would be so kind he would be so affectionate with us that no one would realize that this is the same individual that has so much work pending at the same time when allama was spending time with his kids he would always sometimes he would listen to the chit chat of us or he would teach us how to draw or sometimes he would even give us exercises from our homework and studies and school work this is alama tabatabai at his own home let us take it a little bit further his daughter again narrates that alama would always carry out his own tasks his own chores his own work by himself and without anyone that had the opportunity to help him he would quickly do and perform that chore for example um later on when i was married and i would come and visit my father one point he was quite ill and he was at his bed when i entered the room when i entered the house after a while my father got up from the bed himself and made himself a cup of tea at that point i told my father dear father you could have easily asked me you firstly you're not feeling well you could have taken rest and secondly i'm your daughter you could have asked me i would have made some tea for you the alama says that no firstly you are a guest secondly you are a descendant of the holy prophet you are a sayyida how can i order a sayyida to do any chores or tasks for me this is the refined nature of allama tabatabai let us move on a little bit further his daughter narrates that towards the final moments of my mother my mother was in bed for 27 days my father allama tabatabai would sit next to her bed for all that duration never leaving her side this is the akhlaq that alama tabatabai showed at home whether it's with her with his kids whether it's with his wife but also whether it is generally at home or outside this is an alama tabatabai who was such an accomplished individual but yet has so much to offer and this is again something that we can take from his life swiftly moving on on another facet another category of his life that we can take examples from sayyid muhammad hussein tahrani he says that when i moved into qum i was studying in the school of ayatullah hujjat known as hujjatiya the place that i was in was quite small for us so ayatullah hujjat marhum he bought the land adjacent to us and when he bought it he wanted to expand it in the life of in the way that would be suitable for us and therefore he invited all of the architects from different cities to come and tender for the job so many people from tehran university and many professional individuals came forward wrote their proposals and their tenders forward but ayatullah hujjat found some sort of flow with all of them however we realized we got the news that an individual from tabriz has brought in a proposal that has been accepted by ayatullah hujjat and so his tender his proposal of the architect of the hujjatiya mosque was successful we wanted to find out as to who this individual was we realized that this is the same individual that is an expert in mathematics and also an expert in philosophy and he's also started teaching in the hoza of qum philosophy so we wanted to find out who he was when we finally saw him we realized that this is the individual that is so learned 
He would wear a blue ammama. He would wear clothes that are simpler than average. When he would be walking down the alleys and the roads of Qum, no one would have realized that this is the great Allama Taba Tabai who is an expert in so many different fields. And that, an, that alone an intellectual. We would have thought he's a normal individual. But Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad Dahrani says that this individual, Allama Taba Tabai, proposed such a beautiful architecture for the Hujjatiyah that it was accepted. Let us go a little further into the knowledge of other sciences. His son, Sayyid Mahdi Baqi, his son, Sayyid Mahdi Baqi, he says that my father was an expert in calligraphy. He was an expert in poetry. He was an expert in art. He was an expert in jockey, horse riding, and sharpshooting. And in these skills, he was second to none in the whole of Tabriz. Therefore, no wonder people used to call him Allama. Allama Taba Tawai was so knowledgeable that, he, that even till now, if you want to refer to Allama Taba Tawai, if you just in the circles of students in Qom, Najaf, etc., if you just refer to him as Allama, it is very synonymous that everyone means Allama Taba Tawai, which is why Allama Taba Tawai is so famous for all that he did. These were some of the facets of life that I have tried to bring forward towards yourselves. Clearly, the lives of the Holy Prophet, the lives of the Ahlul Bayt are immaculate and ones that we can follow completely. But there are also times where we feel that we need a contemporary individual. Sometimes we may feel that we need an individual from the Muslim or from the modern world that we can connect to better or we can relate to better. Allama Taba Tabai clearly not only is a great scholar, but he's an expert in many fields, be it sports, art, and Mathematics, and this is something that we can try and emulate within our lives, be it from his dedication, be it from his akhlaq, or even be it from the knowledge of many sciences that we have. Therefore, in order to present a conclusion, the conclusion that I would like to present is many a times we have scholars in our midst. We many a times we are lucky and fortunate to be interacting with many scholars. Let us try and emulate their behaviors. Let us try and make the most of them whilst they are here. And let us try and be, take examples from them that we can. For example, the final hadith that I would like to end with on how to interact with scholars is a hadith by Imam Muhammad al-Baqir. Salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Imam Muhammad al-Baqir says that whenever you approach a sage, whenever you approach a knowledgeable scholar, always be more inquisitive than talkative. Learn how to listen well then learn how to talk well and never interrupt the talk of a scholar. And inshallah, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we are able to get gems and lessons from the life of the Holy Prophet, the Ahlul Bayt, and the scholars that he has appointed for us. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Azizani Grami or Sami in a Muhtaram. Khudaki Kasam. کیسے با وفا ساتھی ہمارے مولا کو کربلا میں ملے تھے خود مولا حسین علیہ السلام نے ناز فرمایا تھا خود مولا حسین علیہ السلام نے فخر فرمایا تھا واللہ خدا کی قسم جیسے صحابی مجھے ملے ہیں ویسے صحابی نہ میرے نانا کو ملے نہ میرے بابا کو ملے نہ میرے بھائی حسن کو ملے امام حسین علیہ السلام کو کیسے وفادات صحابی ملے تھے فرماتے ہیں اوفا ولا خیر من اصحابی جیسے مجھ سے بہترین وفادار صحابی اور کسی کو نہیں ملے عزیزو ایک مرتبہ جب کربلا میں شب آشور کا وقت آتا ہے نا تو ایک مرتبہ مولا حسین علیہ السلام اپنے اصحابیوں کو قریب بلاتے ہیں فرماتے ہیں کہ اے میرے صحابیو دیکھو میں چراغ, کے چراغ کو اب گل کر دیتا ہوں جو جانا چاہتا ہے وہ چلے جائے یہ لوگ جنگ مجھ سے کرنے آئے ہیں تمہیں کوئی دوشی نہیں ٹھہرائے گا تمہیں جانا ہے تو تم چلے جاؤ جانے سے پہلے میرے دو انگلیوں کے درمیان میں دیکھ لو ایک مرتبہ مولا حسین صحابیوں سے کہتے ہیں کہ میرے دو انگلیوں انگلیوں کے درمیان میں دیکھ لو کہ تمہارا جنت میں مقام کتنا بلند اور اعلیٰ ہے ایک مرتبہ مسلم بن اوسجا آتے ہیں مولا کے دو انگلیوں کے درمیان دیکھتے ہیں دنیا میں کربلا میں اپنا جنت میں اپنا مقام دیکھتے ہیں زہیر ابن القین آتے ہیں حبیب ابن المداہر آتے ہیں جان آتے ہیں 
एक के बाद एक सारे सहाबी आते हैं और वापस बैठ जाते हैं अरे मैं कहूंगा चले जाते अपना सर क्यों कटवा दिया जन्नत मिल जाती लेकिन मौला हुसैन के सहाबी थे ना जन्नत में अपना मकाम बनाना कुछ और बात है और रूह फातिमा खुश करना कुछ और बात है अजादारो मौला हुसैन के सहाबियों के में से एक सहाबी थे जिनका नाम था मुस्लिम बिन औसजा एक मर्तबा जब करबला में आशूर का दिन नमोदार होता है तो मुस्लिम बिन औसजा जाते हैं मक्तल की तरफ लड़ते लड़ते एक वो वक्त आया कि मुस्लिम बिन औसजा घोड़े पर संभल न पाए एक मर्तबा मुस्लिम घोड़े से जमीन पर तशरीफ लाते हैं हुसैन खड़े होते हैं हबीब का हाथ थामे हुए मुस्लिम के लाश के पास आते हैं हबीब मुस्लिम के पास बैठ गए और हुसैन खड़े हुए हैं हबीब ने अपने हाथ को मुस्लिम के सीने पे रख दिया फरमाया ए मुस्लिम मैं भी अगर अन करीब जाम शहादत पीने वाला नहीं होता तो तुमसे तुम्हारी आखिरी वसीयत पूछता लेकिन फिर भी ए मुस्लिम बता दो कि अगर तुम्हारी कोई आखिरी वसीयत हो तो मैं पूरी कर दू एक मर्तबा मुस्लिम अपनी आंखों को खोलते हैं हुसैन की तरफ निगाह की फिर हबीब को देखा फरमाया उसी का बिहारा ए हबीब मेरे सैयद आका की मुसरत करना मेरे सैयद आका की ख्याल रखना मैं कहूंगा ए मुस्लिम काश तुम असरे आशूर के वक्त होते मेरा मौला हुसैन फरमाता गया ए मुस्लिम ए हबीब ए अब्बास क्या तुम्हारे आका को सवार नहीं करोगे